There are also aesthetic reasons to defend Cavell's philosophical engagement with cinema. Some of the most interesting filmmakers today have explored the stylistic possibilities of digital images in dialogue with various filmic traditions in ways that suggest we need to think of the medium in terms of aesthetic affordances and artistic possibilities rather than in terms of any virtual substrate or technological mediation or so-called essential defining properties. Think of Terence Malick's use of GoPro footage in his recent films like Night of Cups or Steven Soderbergh's iPhone films like Unsane from 2018 or Jonathan Cowett's remarkable personal documentary, Tarnation, an assemblage of found Super 8 footage, VHS videotape, photograph montages, and answering phone messages. Whatever philosophical dimensions there are to contemporary digital cinema, we should remain attentive to and engaged with the aesthetic possibilities of new digital media, including explorations of virtual reality and their capacities to transform the medium in Cavell's sense. We can say much the same for Gilles Deleuze. Along with Noel Carroll, he was one of the few philosophers to have recognized early on the importance of the digital revolution, not to mention the importance of the brain and body to philosophical engagement with film. His account of the shock to thought that art can engender, how an effective perceptual and bodily encounter with images can force us to think, is highly relevant to the challenges raised by digital media and related developments like VR technology, for example, virtual reality technology. His insistence on the capacity of cinema to create images that solicit new ways of experiencing time, affect and thought, that break with given frames of representation and thereby provoke us to think, remains profoundly important in the digital age. Think, for example, of his interest in experimental television, uh, for instance, Samuel Beckett's television plays. For these reasons, many film philosophers have been thinking with Cavell and Deleuze, but also against Cavell and Deleuze, who open up new forms of film philosophical thinking in response to contemporary audiovisual culture. There is no reason why we should continue to rehearse or repeat Deleuze's own concepts or analyses when it is more in the spirit of Deleuzean cine philosophy to create new concepts in response to mutations in the medium and the challenge of the digital that is transforming the meaning and possibilities of cinema. Think of Patricia Pista's work in this respect, I think a great example. At the same time, I think we should remain critical towards the ambiguous potentials of digital and social media and the effects of the profound technological transformation of social reality today. As Heidegger once observed, the point is not to denounce technology as an evil force or the work of the devil, nor to uncritically celebrate it while remaining blind to its dangers, but rather to think through technology in order to find a more ethically freeing manner of inhabiting the technologically disclosed world. This is how philosophically oriented cinema and television, like the Black Mirror television series, for example, and ethical, philosophy, uh, ethical film philosophy together can contribute to a cultural politics. Such works not only offer a shock to thought, but also an invitation to explore cinema as a way of thinking adequate to our technologically mediated sense of reality. Okay, so the second challenge to uh, film philosophy, philosophy of film and cultural politics. So here's a question from the identity politics theorist, IP. Here's the question. What strikes me about both philosophers of film and film philosophers is that they seem to predicate their philosophical engagement with cinema by passing over or marginalizing cultural politics, whether via the analytic cognitivist critique of grand theory, Cavell's focus on skepticism, or Deleuze's focus on developing a Bergsonian and Persian metaphysical and semiotic typology of movement and time images, philosophical engagement with cinema seems to sideline the more radical political traditions informing film or screen theory. As we know, these traditions foregrounded the central role of ideology and the ways in which film theory could contribute to demystifying the medium and exposing the mechanisms of power that construct dominant and subordinate subject positions according to the axes of class, gender, and so on. Film theorists today are renewing these debates in light of the return to identity politics and hence refocusing their attention on gender, race, the critique of coloniality, Eurocentrism, white supremacy, and so on, to name some key fronts in what, for better or worse, 
was formerly called the culture wars. Would you not say that philosophers of film and film philosophers should be focusing more on identity politics, or at least the ways in which ideology remains important in contemporary cinema? Does doing philosophy of film or film philosophy preclude cultural politics? So first response from the philosopher of film, Pierre. The critique of grand theory did come about during a volatile period in film studies, which at times did take on a culture wars aspect, although the polemics from memory seemed to go in both directions. Think of the lively exchanges between Stephen Heath and Noel Carroll, for example. Still, there is a misconception today that analytic cognitivist film theory is apolitical or unconcerned with social and political issues or somehow blind to ideology. Much depends, of course, on what one means by politics here which has many meanings in contemporary debates. What film and cultural theorists mean by politics in an expanded sense may be quite different from what political philosophers, let alone political theorists, mean by the term. Early volumes by analytic cognitive theorists like Murray Smith and Richard Allen, say, in the late 90s, included discussions of ideology, subjectivity, and politics, including critiques of the Brechtian paradigm in film theory. This has not remained a focus of analytic cognitivist approaches, to be sure, but that is not to say we cannot gain anything from these approaches for understanding films' ideological dimensions. Contemporary cognitivists, especially pluralists, have contributed to understanding affect and emotional engagement with film. Carl Plantinger is a good example. This seems to me a key component in how ideology gets a grip on individual and group subjectivity. It's a... Uh, not for nothing that today we talk of the politics of fear, for example, in regard to right-wing extremism or the insidious appeal of fake news, the influence of conspiracy theories in culture and in politics. This means that we need to understand how audiovisual images manage to capture a retention, channel and direct affect and emotion and shift attitudes and beliefs in ways that are ethically and politically significant. Audiovisual propaganda does not work by appealing to the, quote, unforced force of the better argument, to use Jürgen Habermas's phrase, but rather by the force of images, the power of affect, the links between emotion and cognition, between perception, emotion, and action. That is one way that philosophy of cinema, including cognitive film theory, can contribute to our understanding of ethical, political, and ideological concerns. Second response from the film philosopher FP. I agree that we need to think through cinema in relation to its ethical, political, and ideological dimensions, and that this remains a challenge for contemporary film philosophy. That's why I made a point a moment ago about how philosophy can contribute to cultural politics in relation to cinema. I think we need to be careful though, not to set up a false opposition between philosophical engagement in cinema and political forms of theory with an explicitly activist orientation. I think you can see this with Cavell and Deleuze, for example, whose work has always had a strongly ethical orientation and implicit political dimension, which both remain closely integrated with their respective philosophical concerns. Think of Cavell's exploration of moral perfectionism and his focus on the conditions of democratic life, or his reflections in his book, Cities of Words, on how popular cinema can engage traditions of political philosophy in narrative terms as explored further in Richard Rushton's book on Hollywood cinema and politics, for example. It is true that Cavell's attention is directed towards American cinema and politics, and that there is much to be said here concerning gender, race, and other aspects of identity politics. Cavell always argued, however, that we need to maintain an openness to conversation and dialogue with others as paramount to any philosophical engagement with film lest we revert to a militant and moralizing paradigm of discursive warfare, according to which my interlocutor is an enemy, an evil other to be denounced, rather than a partner in dialogue from whom I might learn. Deleuze too has a strongly ethical focus in his cinema books, from his insistence that cinema has a creative capacity to articulate thought relevant to the contemporary world, to his engagement with cinema as a response to nihilism, and a means of providing reasons to believe in this world. There is also Deleuze's more explicitly political exploration of minor cinema, with its political focus on marginalized, subjugated, and or colonized peoples who find in their impossible conditions of subjugation the tools 
to create cinema with the potential for creating new modes of existence, while at the same time critically resisting the intolerable status quo imposed by different forms of social and cultural domination. And then there are Deleuze's remarks on the society of control, which resonate powerfully today and have been taken up by filmmakers and theorists concerned with the dangers posed by the rise of what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Again, think of Black Mirror as a, a great cinematic example of this kind of exploration. Now, I'm not saying that these two thinkers, Cavell and Deleuze, have all the answers, but the response to the philosophical, ethical, and political questions raised by cinema are, to my mind, worth the time of your life, if you like, to reflect upon and understand. Many contemporary film philosophers are exploring in a critical and creative manner how to move beyond Deleuze's own thinking, drawing on the conceptual tools we might find in his work in order to respond to the cultural, political, and ethical challenges we face in our globalized work. I think of here the work of all of our keynotes, David Roderick, Patricia Pistas, David Martin Jones, and Richard Rushton, for example. Again, we can take our cue from filmmakers in a world of global cinemas, as David Martin Jones puts it, whose aesthetically complex and politically committed works provoke and express thought in ways that are both philosophically productive and ethico-politically resistant. When it comes to politicizing from philosophy, we should let a thousand flowers bloom, to use an old slogan. We should welcome a plurality of philosophical perspectives that take up whatever concepts or philosophical approaches that might help us engage with contemporary cultural politics, but in ways that remain open and constructive creative and critical, rather than being dogmatic, sectarian, or doctrinaire. That said, I would add that we should avoid falling into the trap of reductively instrumentalizing cinema as no more than a vehicle for ideology. This is important whether we are critiquing the ethical, cultural, racial, or political biases of a particular film, or promoting the moral pedagogical benefits of marginalized, radical, or overtly cultural political works. The interplay between aesthetic and ethico-political dimensions of cinema and television remains an irreducible feature of their aesthetic complexity and expression of meaning, a point that contemporary film philosophers would be wise to acknowledge. Okay, the third challenge now, cinematic thinking. That is philosophical cherry picking or transformative encounter. That's the challenge. Here's cultural theorist CT putting a question to us. These are fine words from you both, and I applaud the sentiment behind them. But many, many philosophers still have doubts about the so-called bold or strong versions of the film as philosophy thesis. That is the idea that cinema can contribute in an original and significant manner to philosophical understanding by exclusively cinematic means. It is difficult but not impossible to show how cinematic works can contribute in an original manner to philosophical or ethical understanding or even to political change. But I don't see how we can make such bold claims without raising the distinction between philosophy and film, or indeed philosophy and art, in ways that are implausible or questionable. Films do not, in a philosophical sense, offer arguments or give reasons or make theoretical generalizations, although I do grant that they can be regarded as thought experiments or complex examples, say, for further philosophical reflection. But this is to admit only the moderate version of the Filmus philosophy thesis, which still leaves the bold version in abeyance. Now, I don't wish to rehearse these arguments here, but I would like to raise a related issue, which chimes with BU's question, the digital utopian. Why do philosophers of film and film philosophers tend to focus on narrative film, whether it's popular, world cinema, art house cinema, etc., rather than other forms of cinema, say like documentary, or for that matter, television. Don't we need to expand what film philosophy means to encompass television, documentary, digital media, and so on? Now, the author has made some initial forays in these directions, but the question remains. Have philosophers of film and film philosophers focused on particular kinds of narrative film in order to cherry pick, like selectively um, uh, pick examples that would fit or confirm the uh, film as philosophy thesis? Isn't this a circular or question-begging form of argument, what Wartenberg, Tom Wartenberg, that is, sometimes calls the imposition objection, recalling the very flaw for which grand theorists were criticized? Do we really need philosophy in order to engage with cinema? 
What can philosophy add to our cultural understanding of film and other audiovisual media? So first response from film philosopher, FP. That's an important and challenging question. I would say the film philosophy approach emphasizes the importance of our aesthetic experience of film, defending whatever theoretical claims one might make with reference to the film philosophical readings of films that one offers. The author, as I understand it, is guided here by Stephen Mulhall's idea of the priority of the particular, namely that in aesthetics or philosophy of art, we need to foreground the role of particular cases of individual works that provide philosophical evidence, so to speak, or aesthetic corroboration supporting our theoretical claims. As he discusses in his book, the claims made in film philosophy cannot be decided purely on theoretical grounds, but require, as Cavell also argues, recourse to philosophical film criticism. That is, the testing of one's aesthetic experience with particular films via philosophical interpretation and critical reflection. Like the author in my own work, I also draw on Deleuze's claim that cinema can enact a shock to thought, that it performs a cinematic thinking in images that both challenges and resists philosophy, provoking us to think in response to what film enables us to experience without however reducing cinema to a mere reflection of an assumed philosophical framework. Taken together, these Cavellian and Deleuzean ideas present guides to performing what the author sometimes calls romantic film philosophy. The author goes on to discuss a variety of examples, two independent philosophical documentaries about the life and thought of a philosopher, for instance, an art cinema crossover or generically hybrid film, Melancholia, and an innovative dystopian television series, Black Mirror. Surely that is some attempt at expanding and diversifying what counts as film philosophy. Now, a further question from the identity politics theorists, IP. That's all very well, but I still feel that you are avoiding my question about identity politics in film. What about the identity politics of which films we choose to discuss? Which filmmakers are deemed worthy of philosophy? Which traditions or subjectivities, including identities, genders, races, sexualities, and so on, are excluded from philosophical consideration? Don't these issues play an important, even central role in film philosophy today? Moreover, by choosing philosophical documentaries or so-called art films, the author is skewing the film philosophy relationship in favor of philosophy by avoiding, in typically elitist fashion, dealing with popular genres and films from diverse contexts. Such elitism simply reproduces the kind of philosophical disenfranchisement of film and its attendant cultural, racial, and colonial biases that the author claims can be overturned by the film philosophy approach. Even if you were able to show that some films can do philosophy, this would not show that film in general can be philosophical, which is presumably what philosophical readings of popular genres and films intend to show. Nor would it address the demand for diversity as a central criterion for defining what should count as philosophy in the first place. So response from the philosopher of film, Pierre. These are important points and have certainly become central again in contemporary film theory debates, which have been marked by a return to ideology, not so much in relation to class politics or the critique of capitalism as in the past, but more in relation to cultural politics and the critique of colonialism. There is no question that the philosophical canon remains overwhelmingly masculinist and Anglo or Eurocentric in character, and it is certainly an important issue to address critically and to shift over time. The impetus for this, I suggest, often comes from filmmakers themselves, who are typically at the forefront of these cultural political struggles and making films that portray diverse, non-European, post-colonial and marginalized perspectives on dominant or hegemonic ways of representing and experiencing social reality. A film I just saw in Berlin recently, the Afrofuturist science fiction and musical film Neptune Frost by American rapper Saul Williams and his partner, filmmaker Anissia Uzeman, is a case in point, filmed in Rwanda and set in Burundi. That said, I would be wary of reducing films as artistic and philosophical works to a crude reflection of the filmmakers, audience, or critics' identity or social cultural context or reducing them to ideologically correct narratives designed to re-engineer dominant modes of consciousness. 
Historical attempts to instrumentalize cinema in this fashion have usually failed or backfired. If anything, cinema enables the decentering of subjectivity and identity in ways that are conducive to a more fluid, pluralistic, differentiated, and plastic sense of identity, actually much better construed as difference. Uh, and it does this perhaps more successfully than many other contemporary art forms. Cinema as an art is plastic and transformative rather than rigid and prescriptive. In the defense of the author, moreover, I would say that there is no reason to assume that the Fulmer's philosophy thesis must be a fully generalizable claim. Indeed, there may well be only select instances of filmmaking that elicit a suitably philosophical ethical response or that count as cases of cinematic thinking. Like aesthetic value, philosophical value may be an evaluative rather than objective property of individual works. That is to say, more a matter of experiencing, interpreting and analyzing a work in certain ways uh, than detecting or defining some pre-existing property within it. So now another question from the cultural theorist CT. In a related vein, I wanted to ask, ask you both, PF and FP, about the author's approach in his book, which I understand is an attempt to model how one might go about the philosophical engagement with film or how one might do film philosophy. Don't these same issues, the challenge of the digital question of identity politics and the problem of how to engage with cinema philosophically in ways that are not reductive or anachronistic, circular or biased, don't these same problems arise in the author's book? As Martin Rousseau has recently argued in his book, Transformational Ethics of Film, Thinking the Cinema Makeover in the Film Philosophy Debate, which was published last year by Brill, don't film philosophers rely on a tacit model of transformative ethics that shapes their otherwise ungrounded claims that films can do philosophy, or more boldly, that films can even transform our ways of thinking or even our ethical modes of existence? So a response from the film philosopher. Thank you for your insightful question about the film philosophy approach. For my own part, and in defense of the author's book, I would admit there is a degree of elitism, so-called, uh, which I take to be a moralizing accusation though, rather than a philosophical objection, a degree of elitism in choosing certain films rather than others. Exercising one's own aesthetic or philosophical tastes cannot help but be so. This is an elitism, however, that is plural and open-ended, an elitism of artistic and philosophical achievement rather than one of pernicious ideological exclusion. Excellence in cinematic art can be achieved in many ways, in many styles, and in many genres. In popular romance, as much as experimental film, in horror, as much as documentary, self-reflective art film, as much as action or sci-fi genres, in digital cinema, as in serial television. Nonetheless, as Cavell remarks, films that can take the condition of film as their subject tend to enjoy an inherent philosophical advantage or greater degree of self-understanding than other less self-aware or self-questioning works. It is understandable that films inviting the viewer to think, to feel, and to question should have their invitations accepted. I would add that there is also an ethical decision at stake in devoting time and thought to films or television shows that question established conventions and that experiment with evoking new ways of thinking and feeling. In a global cultural and economic marketplace dominated by certain types of stories or ideological points of view, there is an ethical purpose in devoting attention to the more marginal or questioning, more aesthetically demanding films that one encounters. This is one reason, I assume, why the author discusses two lesser known philosophical documentaries. Although documentary film has become popular in recent years, documentaries focusing on philosophers themselves remain an intriguing, lesser known, but also innovative subgenre that offer ideal cases for exploring the film and philosophy relationship. Now, another question or response from the cultural theorist, CT. I can see why these examples would be good ones for the argument of the book and why they can be defended on philosophical grounds. But isn't there still a degree of arbitrariness of cherry picking in the kinds of film, whether they're traditional, popular, televisual, art house or digital, that we choose to discuss philosophically in our work? Can we ever escape the imposition objection that is that philosophers impose rather than find philosophical meaning in films. And if not, shouldn't we admit to our privileges, to our biases and blind spots more readily? Response by the philosopher of film, Pierre. 
these are important questions getting to the heart of what philosophers think they are doing when they engage with cinema. As you noted earlier, the moderate version of the Fulmer's philosophy thesis is now widely accepted, even though as far critics of this approach uh, are you know, still uh, unconvinced. The bold version, of course, is still controversial with debate continuing as to its coherence and plausibility. The author, as you may know, thinks one can defend a bold version of this idea by way of the concept of cinematic thinking, the idea that cinema can serve as a medium of philosophical and ethical experience. Indeed, one, can, uh, one way we can defend the idea of film contributing to philosophical understanding, he argues, is via the cinematic experience that we can have that may foster the imaginative reordering of beliefs, questioning of assumptions, or shifting of philosophical perspectives. Cinema's, cinema does not generally introduce radically new ideas or profoundly re-educate or, for that matter, manipulate viewers. But it can remind us of what we think we know it can clarify, but also probe or query our intuitions and beliefs. And it can enable us to reorder and refine our thinking, particularly concerning moral beliefs and attitudes, in ways that are philosophically significant and cognitively productive. This is what analytic philosophers of art call aesthetic cognitivism. These forms of affective and cognitive experience, essential, for example, in engaging with cinematic thought experiments, may be one way of explaining how films can be philosophical in ways specific to the medium and thus offer support for the bold version of the film's philosophy thesis. Now, a response from the film philosopher FP. I agree with my colleague, but want to answer from a different perspective. I think that these criticisms of philosophical approaches to cinema, that they are elitist, biased, cherry picking or circular, are understandable, but also misguided. Here I can only agree with PF's responses regarding the potential for cinema to enhance, refine, and extend our philosophical and ethical understanding. We can have philosophical and ethical experiences with cinema. If film philosophers are responding to the aesthetic, moral, and philosophical experiences that certain films can elicit, then it is not surprising that they appear to cherry pick films that are conducive to both eliciting and expressing this kind of philosophical and ethical engagement. From this point of view, Film philosophers are not engaging in a questionable imposition of their philosophical views. Rather, they are responding in a conceptual manner to the varieties of philosophical and ethical experience that cinema makes possible for us. One suggestion then is that we should shift the ground of the debate, focusing more on cinema as a philosophical and ethical experience. This is one way of recasting what cinema can do. It can both express and elicit experiences of cinematic thinking which depend upon the ways in which aesthetic, imaginative, and emotional engagement with cinematic works can open up new paths for thinking, perhaps even new ways of being. For these reasons, I think we need to recall that audiovisual works of art, like all art, not only offers experiences that are pleasurable and fascinating, wondrous and absorbing, disturbing and arousing. They can also provoke and express thought in ways that force us to think and feel outside of our habitual routines and stereotypical regimes. Cinema can reveal and express the world anew, offering ways of thinking and feeling that are urgently required in our troubled and troubling world. It may even offer us, offer us experiences with ethically transformative power. If that sounds too speculative or romantic, which it probably is, all I can say is that it recalls one of the most admirable ways I know of thinking about art and beauty. I mean the idea that cinema, like beauty, offers us only the promise of happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Okay. Ah, there we go. I seem to have my, am I there? What's happened? Um, hello, am I there? What's happened? Um, I still on the screen, more audible. Uh, hello. You can hear us? The connection was lost. Okay. Um, 
li login again. Oh, okay. I'll stay live. Okay. Doctor Sim, are you still there? Oh yes, yes I am. Yeah. <laughs> I think we um, momentarily so, lost lost Ms. our connection. Uh, I'm repeating the question. We we live in a time when reality is questioned and personalized. Ah. See that my experiments on reality and blends it with fiction in its own terms both in documentary and fiction. Uh, do you think this blurred line between reality and fiction possesses mm -hmm. a threat against the ethics of cinema? Or on the contrary, it is a blessing in terms of giving way to philosophical thinking? Mm -hmm. now, I think that's a very important question and very much um, at the heart of a lot of what I was discussing, exploring in, in this dialogue. So um, I think that's always been one of the fascinating and for some people disturbing potentials of cinema. It has the capacity to, and, and think about the history of film theory and film production here as well, the capacity for elaborating fantasy and exploring imaginative worlds, but also the capacity for capturing reality and giving a very realistic sense of consciousness, of perception of, of the way the world is. And it can do both the capacity for fantasy and the capacity for realistic representation. So that blurred boundary is inherent to the medium. It's both what makes possible, you know, the extraordinary flourishing of uh, fictional narrative cinema, but it also makes possible, you know, traditions of realism, but also of documentary and uh, nonfiction film. So it is something inherent to the, and uh, part of the potential of the medium. Um, so I think the ethical, question both for filmmakers and also for you know the, the culture more generally is both how we uh, approach film how we make sense of it how films are made for what purposes um how audiences are i suppose educated to uh, receive and respond to to cinema one of the big challenges today and i think this is one of the issues i try to raise in the debate uh, concerns the sort of skeptical issues arising, particularly around digital images today, because um, a lot of the more traditional ways of thinking about cinema, about photography and analog images, uh, does rest on the idea of a certain realism or a certain link between the image and uh, some uh, object in, in social or external reality. Um, whereas with digital images, we're dealing with a mathematical model, uh, a simulation rather than a, a representation in that more analog sense. So the whole question of the link between images and reality is a very live and important issue for us today. I think cinema has a, a very important role to play here in exploring, examining, reflecting on, even uh, critiquing the ways in which images can be used and understood, uh, the way they both shape our sense of social reality, but can also distort our sense of social reality. And I think there are many examples of filmmakers and, and television series, I mentioned Black Mirror, that explore this question. So I think that uh, issue of a blurred boundary is, is both a potential for cinematic exploration and cinematic art, but it's also uh, an important ethical and cultural concern about uh, our way of understanding and relating to images and how they link with, with social reality. So, I, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Thank you. That was a great response. And we are all, uh, we all appreciate that. And uh, I think we are running out of time. That's why uh, we need to end the uh, session here. But uh, thank you for coming and hope to meet you in person someday and have a great day. Thank you very much. I really uh, appreciated the session and the invitation, and I hope the conference goes extremely well. I will try and tune in when I can. You. As you can hear, there's an enthusiastic crowd here, so they all appreciate that too. Thank you, Thank and you have a nice day. Thank you very much.